Welcome to Pieces for My Puzzle. I'm your host, Nikki Ship, and I'm excited to be sharing with you my life with a son on the spectrum. This podcast is for anyone who is looking for quick tips and perspective, but most of all, for hope and inspiration. So sit back, relax, and let's put the pieces together. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Pieces for My Puzzle. I'm your host, Nikki Ship. Thank you so much for joining us today. Last week, we spoke about how to keep your marriage strong, even throughout the stress of having a special needs child. Hopefully, you found some great little uh, golden nuggets of information in there uh, that you found helpful for yourself and for your spouse and for your family. This week, we're going to talk about some of the misconceptions about autism in efforts to bring more awareness about the condition itself. Um, It's so funny, and I think that for those of you listening or or watching today on YouTube that have a child on the spectrum, it's, it's interesting what people will come and say to you or the misconceptions that they might have about autism, and I'm sure you've experienced that yourself when uh, comments are made or the certain um, questions are asked uh, of you about about autism. And sometimes it's hard to explain those, those things or those conditions or those behaviors. And so I found uh, a really great article by Kim Barloso from Autism Parenting Magazine. And she wrote an article that basically talks about a lot of these myths So I wanted to read just a few um, of these common myths. I have six of them here today that I'm going to share with you on the show. But I think it's important to get the right information and be aware of basic facts about autism. And, you know, it was my immediate reaction was almost to be offended when people would ask me questions in the beginning when Drayson was first diagnosed um, to feel a little bit on the defense or offended Um, and not really exactly sure how to answer questions for people. So I think that this is really important because if you have some basic facts about autism, you can use this as an opportunity to educate others and to talk to people and to bring more awareness and acceptance um, of those on the spectrum. So I'll put this link in the show notes about this article that I'm referring to, but I'm going to talk about some of the common myths around just the diagnosis itself. Um, around, uh, there's a lot of uh, misconceptions about um, how, uh, how to go about getting a diagnosis, how to navigate that. And so there's a lot of common myths. So the first one is that there's no official test for autism. So while there's no medical test, like a blood test, Right. So some people, if there's um, an illness or an ailment, you know, you see it more throughout a blood test. There's no actual medical test or blood test to indicate. Um, However, there are evaluations that can be conducted. And the CDC actually states that a person must go through two processes to be diagnosed with autism. And the first one is um, a developmental screening. And the second one is a comprehensive diagnostic evaluation, which Drayson had both. Um, these two um, have to be done to receive an autism diagnosis. So don't take it for just the fact that, you know, um, if somebody tells you that, oh, you know, we did a developmental screening and there's no need to to, to move on, there's actually a second um, form of evaluation, a comprehensive diagnostic evaluation that can take place. Um, should be You should be screened. Kids now, they're, they're encouraging screenings between the ages of 18 and 24 months um, is when screening should start. So if this is something that you're not aware of um, or you're not sure if your pediatrician is doing, ask. Ask for the screenings to be done. Like I said, um, they said between the ages of 18 and 24 months. And there's other things even prior to that that they can do to check developmentally how that child's doing. Um, The CDC also has on their website an article called Myths About Developmental Screening, which I thought was a great article, and I'll put that in the show notes for you guys to refer to. But it's a great article on some of the myths about screening itself, which I thought was was a great way to get some clarity on, especially when you're going through uh, potentially a diagnosis for autism. 
The second myth is a great deal of training is needed to administer screening correctly. Now, training requirements are there and they are required, but they're not extensive and most screening tools um, can be administered by paraprofessionals. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. And we're talking about screening, not diagnostic tools, but screening tools in order to then say, should we go get, uh, you know, should we look further and have some further testing to see if there's a potential diagnosis there? So um, the, there's not a great deal of training that's needed. Um, and it doesn't, and it can, like I said, be administered even by paraprofessionals. Myth number three, screening takes a lot of time. So now there's many screening instruments. Um, most of them actually take less than 15 minutes to administer, and some require only about two minutes of professional time. This, again, is just screening, a precursor to, if you will. Um, now, the actual evaluations themselves may take a lot longer. We've, I mean, we've, I can't even tell you how many evaluation booklets that I have filled out as a parent um, on Drayson's development. Um, so evaluations can take longer, but initial screening should not take that long. It can be done in 15 minutes or less um, with the with the adequate, the most adequate screening tool available to that paraprofessional, a professional, or um, or to any care provider. Um, there should be some basic screening tools available to them, and if not, ask. You know, if you take your, if you're concerned that your child might have autism and you're in a doctor's appointment with your pediatrician, ask your pediatrician. Oftentimes they're going to give you a referral, which is what our pediatrician did. She gave us a referral to a developmental pediatrician for Drayson's diagnosis. <clears throat> Myth number four tools that incorporate information from the parents are not valid. I love this one. Um, and I think that's a, a misconception as parents, too. We just think, okay, well, we're going to leave them to do the evaluation. But there's a lot of input that's going to be needed by you for a diagnosis. Um, parents are generally valid and are predictive of developmental delays. Research has shown that uh, parental concerns detect about 70 to 80 percent of children with disabilities. So don't ignore your intuition, guys. Don't ignore, you know, what you think – may or may not be a problem. It's always going to be in your benefit to seek professional help, have an evaluation done, and just get everything ruled out. If it ends up being nothing, it ends up being nothing. But at the same time, you don't want to wait because the longer you wait, then the less of an opportunity or advantage that they have to get the therapies and the care that they need. Be brutally honest with yourself and answer questions um, honestly. Many, you know, a lot of us don't want to believe that there's a problem, and so we mask answers to our questions. Um, unfortunately, when you go through some of these types of questionnaires, you have to be brutally honest about where your child is, about their behaviors, um, and and what your concerns are. And that's really hard because, no, you know, we always want to be able to brag about our kids we don't want to, um, you know, think negatively about our children, right? Um, and so sometimes talking about certain behaviors or things that they're doing that aren't maybe socially acceptable, that's a hard, that's a hard conversation to have even internally with yourself. Myth number five, there's no treatment for autism. While there is no cure for autism, because there's no, there's no cure as of yet, um, there are many treatments and therapies that can reduce the challenges and improve their quality of life. Like I've talked to, uh, talked about, excuse me, on several times on other shows, you know, we, we have um, a behavioral a therapy in home that's ABA based that we work with our providers on. We have speech, we have OT. Um, we even have a personal trainer that works in the gym that does workouts with Drayson now in the gym. And um, all of these things are important because those treatments, those therapies help Drayson. Um, and we've seen the changes in him. We've seen him evolve. We've seen him improve. And a lot of that is because of the therapies that we have. So while there's no cure, there's there are so many therapies out there and accessible to you if you just go looking for them. Um 
We also are working on maybe looking into more of a communication-based therapy, and that's something that um, would be expanded with his speech therapy. And that uh, also could be a potential route that we might take to see if it helps him um, with any of with any of his behaviors. Early interventions um, that are available and mandated in the U.S. Um, by the schools, uh, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. It's also called IDEA. I've mentioned this in a previous podcast before about IEPs. Um, you should know that term and others um, and others terms that are used in the school system, like IEP, FAPE, IDEA. All of these terms are very important that you understand and know them, especially when they start going to school, because there are early interventions that are available and mandated by these uh, by this act. Okay, and that's really important to know that you don't want to go to a school if the, just because they tell you no that that resource isn't available. Get another opinion. Ask above their heads. Find out because there are supposed to be interventions and uh, services available uh, within that within that school system. Myth number six: there is no medication for autism. Now, autism itself, that is true. There is no exact medication for autism. However, the CDC states that there are no, um, excuse me, I just said that, that there are no medications, pardon me, that can cure autism spectrum disorder or treat the main symptoms of autism. That is true. However, some medications can help treat certain conditions associated with autism. And as I've mentioned before, there are many secondary diagnoses that happen um, for someone that, that is on the spectrum. And Drayson has anxiety, um, global developmental delay, and uh, we have him on medication to help him with his anxiety and ADHD. And uh, we have found that that has helped him improve significantly and not to be so stressed and to actually calm down a little bit because uh, situations that aren't stressful to us are actually very stressful to him. So there are lots of different types of medications out there that can help with certain conditions um, such as irritability, aggression, depression, hyperactivity, anxiety, and such. Just remember that medical, all medical treatments, although, of course, should be FDA approved and recommended by your doctor. So I am not a doctor. <laughs> so I am encouraging you to go seek, to, go seek your uh, professional help and talk to your, um, your, your uh, pediatrician. I hope this helps to get you clear about some of the facts about autism or perhaps at least about the diagnosis itself and gives you a more defined way of explaining to others when you're trying to bring forth a little bit more awareness, um, especially when it comes to the diagnosis itself. And as you um, discover more throughout an autism diagnosis that you also learn additional myths and become myth busters to help build that awareness and acceptance in the autism community. This concludes our episode for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you have questions, comments, or even a show topic that you would like to hear on the show, please shoot me an email at info at piecesformypuzzle.com. I can't wait to hear from you, and I would love to hear um, some feedback and comments from you as well. Feel free to like and follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you haven't already, and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Pieces for My Puzzle. If you like what you're hearing, please spread the word to others so that we can help build awareness and acceptance in the autism community and feel free to give us a good rating on your preferred podcast platform of choice. Thanks again for tuning in and until next time, keep working on your puzzle and remember you don't have to have it all solved in a day. Take care.